I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'm requesting order again for the college. Again. Order, please. My name is Tim. And welcome to the College of Complexes. The College of Complexes consists of the following the format. Take this home. One, we have our speaker who will then speak after a brief announcements period. Then we will have a question and answer period after that. And then um, after the question and answer period, you'll we'll get your chance to do your infamous rebuttal period. Yes, we do have a speaker tonight after that long... Uh, Subliminal bloviations of announcers. The solution to Chicago's game by gang violence. All Atlantic candidate David Earl Williams III. He says, in the past we've had politicians either turn a blind eye to the growing gang violence or suggest we use military force, federally or state, to quell such activities. There's a more reasonable and cost-effective solution to fix Chicago gang violence. To understand why people join gangs, you must, you have to understand human motivation and need. Let's welcome tonight's speaker, David Earl Williams III. Thanks for having me back here. It was like a year ago I was here, and I have to say this is a very diverse political group. So I appreciated the constructive criticisms the last time, even though some of you may have agreed with me or not, but I had fun. So that's why I'm happy to be back here again. So a little bit about myself. My name is David Earl Williams III. I'm running for alderman in the 48th Ward, and that's pretty much East Andersonville, Edgewater, and uh, North Uptown Chicago. Uh, I grew up actually in Uptown Chicago on Lawrence and Broadway, right next door to Aragon Theater and uh, Riviera. So I went to Nicholson High School. You, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yes, yeah, so I went to Nicholson High School. I graduated from there. I was in the U.S. Navy for four years, stationed in Yokosuka, Japan, uh, 2002 to 2006, stationed on board the USS Calpin CG 63. Um, went off to Canada pretty much for four years. I did uh, two years of school out there. I was doing uh, criminal justice at first, but I decided to do general studies because I didn't want the extra stress. So then I came back to the U.S. in 2010, and that's when I started getting politically involved, um, just because I care for this country. You know, look, I've worked with Republicans, I've worked with Democrats, I've worked even with the Libertarian Party for a little bit. I left them recently. And, and I've even worked with one Green Party candidate. Uh, his name was uh, Simon Rivero, I think that's how I pronounce it. He ran for Congress in the Illinois 9th District a while ago. And, you know, with my political journey, you know, some people were like, oh, well, you, you sure like to jump around from parties to parties. Well, you know, I'm more politically well-rounded, and this is why I consider myself to be an independent, because I can't say, I don't think there's anybody who agrees with one party 100% on every issue. Yeah. And then lots of people tend to be moderate independents anyway. So, the reason why I'm here tonight, I'm talking about my solution on how to solve the Chicago gang violence. And the start with my number one thing is, I think it would be the obvious, would be to at least end the war on drugs, and that is uh, the full legalization of marijuana. No fine if you're caught with it, because they uh, charge you a, a ticket if you're caught with 15 grams or more. And I would even go as further with saying that if you decriminalize the harder substances, not having any jail time, but, you know, offer services such as rehab instead of putting them in cages with, uh, you know, rapists and murderers. Because if you're going to put them in there, they're not going to get over uh, their substance abuse. And you're just going to make them uh, worse criminals. And it doesn't even make sense if there is this big thing where we're having, if you're, if you're more involved with the family, um, family issues where there's no father in the house or whatever it may be, well, you, this predominantly does affect a lot of uh, minorities, a lot of blacks. And if you're taking them away from their kids, well, there goes your family structure right there. Uh, I've always talked about cracking down on illegal guns, but at the same time respecting the uh, rights of the law-abiding citizens. Because, you know, I'm pretty sure some of you might be very much anti-Second Amendment here, some of you are for it. And I, I do have to remind those who are, you know, there was a 2010 uh, Supreme Court ruling with Otis McDonald versus the city of Chicago, where it pretty much 
reinstated that, you know, you have a right to your Second Amendment, with, at least for handgun rights. And the, uh, Otis McDonald, by the way, was a 76-year-old black retired uh, maintenance engineer who lived in Morgan Park, and, you know, he was dealing on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis with gangs, the drugs, and uh, robberies, and, you know, him and two other individuals, they took all the way to the Supreme Court, and they were able to reaffirm, you know, their right to defend themselves with a handgun. Because this, this was actually banned I believe in 1982 in Chicago, where you had to actually register a handgun, shotgun for some reason, you didn't have to do that. Uh, now, on the issue of guns, though, I'll tell you this, I am in favor, actually, you know, when it comes to local regulations, per se, because the states can regulate the Second Amendment to a degree. I mean, we do have the background checks, we do have uh, also mental health as well. But I also want to point out that, as of recent, there has been um, active shooter alarms that would have been installed uh, throughout 20 schools in Illinois and four of them in Chicago. And you're wondering, what is an active uh, shooter alarm? Well, it looks like a fire alarm, but it's blue, and this pretty much alerts the police you know, to come to the schools when it happens. Uh, there's four of them, like I said, in Chicago. Uh, one of them happens to be the private school, St. Benedict's. They recently put this in. This is from a manufacturer by a company called Blue Point Alert Solutions. They're from Elgin. Now on civility. Yes, I believe in school choice. You know, I do think that if there's a choice out there where you send your kids to other schools, that's a great, that's, that's a great thing. But I, I'll give you a fun fact real quick. Because I mean, I went to a public school, I turned out fine. Now, some people like to bash public schools, but I would like to give my own personal opinion about like charters, for example, because there tends to be a lot of hyper-segregation charter schools. There tends to be a less, uh, how should I say, academic success for some of them. And the exposure rate tends to be a lot higher. You, you don't see that in public schools. That's just my bias, but that's actual fact, too. And then, you know, if you want to uh, cease with the uh, gang violence, well, it makes sense stop closing the schools in the urban areas. They will have somewhere to go. Yes? No, no. I'm no. Oh, okay. That's your asking your question. Um, yeah. Now, offering the gang members, uh, you know, a second chance in life when it comes to providing them with you know, means of financial stability when it comes through incursion, like maybe a state job or something in the private sector where they can actually get back on their feet. And, you know, for myself, I come from a working poor family, you know, raised by a single mother you know, along with my two sisters, and I didn't really know much what I wanted to do after high school, and I ended up joining the Navy. And that, I, I felt that was a great way to get a world experience and, well, get me out of a lot of trouble. And I think the same thing should be uh, applied to those who, uh, Perhaps need that, even though the National Guard. I'm not for the National Guard being on the streets, by the way. What was your designation in the Navy? So at the time, because the rates have changed, the rates of job, I was a SK3, so I was paid off as a third class doorkeeper, third class, yes. uh, but they're called logistics specialists now. So I was in charge of over $2 billion worth of aviation equipment mm -hmm. at the age of 20, well, 20, because I went there 18, I was a deck seaman for two years starting off, so I was undesignated. So I was doing the security watches, uh, sweeping, mopping, mm -hmm. and uh, driving the ship. That was fun. <laughs> at a young age, you get to learn a lot and get to mature really quick. And my last point, um, well, ex-felons, they do have a right to vote, but a lot of them don't know this, so I think that needs to be more expanded. Ex-felons? They can vote? They can vote, but they don't know this. They, I think that should be expanded on where they're made aware, because a lot of them don't, because usually when I've been out, if I'm petitioning, you know, like running for this specific uh, office, or in the past, I've run into a lot of people who aren't even aware of their voting rights. I think that needs to be expanded upon. Uh, now, when it comes to the Chicago police, for example, I mean, we've all heard about, I mean, this, is, this was ongoing with Juan McDonald when he was, you know, unfortunately shot in the back by um, J Officer Jason Van Dyke. And he was recently uh, you know, sentenced to prison you know, for second degree murder of the kid. And ironically, today, October 20th, three years ago, was the day when uh, Laquan McDonald was killed. And, you know, from that, you know, we've seen uh, civilian-based organizations such as COPA, the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, which was established on October 5th, 2016. Uh, they're there, you know, pretty much uh, being um, the overseer for, you know, actual cases of police brutality and reported it to make sure that the cops are being held accountable. And I want to put off real quick, I don't hate cops. I've had my ex-step uncle, who's a retired police officer, and I think that regardless where you work at, if it's in the... Uh, public or private sector, you know, if you're doing a job, you should be held accountable, though. And I've always respected police officers. But, you know, when, when there's bad behavior, you do have to uh, punish it, though. Especially in the military, like, I'll give you an example. 
at the time when the USS Kitty Hawk, the aircraft carrier that was around it, it decommissioned in 2009, I believe. You used to have people who would go off of there into town. Uh, they would be the bunk cab drivers. I was stationed in Japan. And they would do things they shouldn't be doing. Now, if you expect military members, which, which they did, you know, they were sent to the brig, and they also, you know, were eventually dishonored and discharged. Now, if you expect military members to act a certain way to maintain a global reputation and respect with others, we should, you know, expect, you know, the police to do the same thing. Because there's just, you know, that's how it is. I mean, if you're here to serve and protect, well, you should. <laughs> uh, but I also want to say, if we're going to uh, at least solve some of our homicide rates, because I'll give you some figures real quick. Chicago, the current numbers I have uh, for Chicago police uh, personnel, there's about 12,051 that are active right now. And we have, let's see here, uh, they have a, a $1.3 billion budget. If you compare that to New York City, now New York you know, has like uh, 55,000 on their force and they have a $5.6 billion budget. If I am to become alderman, uh, well, for one, I'd like to increase that to two billion because the only reason why I said I would increase it to two billion is because of the fact there's just a lack of detectives and we're, our, nas our, our rate of solving homicides is 43% when the national average is 68, and that's pretty low. And I think if we had more detectives, it, this would be solved for the, the legitimate crimes anyway. You know, these are just a combination of things I wanted to talk about. These are, you know, some of my solutions. You don't have to necessarily agree, but I think it would be better than trying to have, you know, the National Guard on the street, you know, breaking skulls because, look, you're, if, you, if you think they're just going to be sent to the south and west side, where the crime mainly is happening, this is going to be spread throughout the city, regardless of uh, what your views are on that. And I'd rather see, you know, solutions like these implemented compared to, you know, everyone losing their freedoms because of, you know, false sense of security. So that's what I have wanted to say here. That's my spiel. That's it? Yeah, that's it. All right. <laughs> Straight to the point. All right, you know, you, you've talked about curbing gang violence. Mm -hmm. You've talked about things. Can you get a little more specific about what your solution to the gang violence problem is? You hinted at it a little bit in your opening remarks, but can you elaborate on what you specifically would do to stop gang violence? Well, a lot of it is just the lack of education opportunities, when, again, going back to how they're closing the schools. On, on the southwest side. That, that's one thing. You know, I can't, as an alderman or, or whatever politician, you know, whatever officer running that, you, you can't provide a father or a mother that, that's right. lacking the family. But you know, there there are programs such as uh, BAM. They recently introduced that's called Becoming the Man, which is mentor programs that are helping them stay in school and things such as in that nature. But I'm talking about keeping the, the education foundation that's there. Because it, it, you know, you have Rahm Emanuel. He was. But Ronner, you know, closing the schools on the southwest side in favor of their charter schools, and that didn't help. Because you, you, if they have nowhere to go, then it, it's what is the uh, old saying, the adage is, uh, idle minds are the devil's playground. They're going to be doing very stupid things. And like, talking about ending the war on drugs, well, a lot of it is drug-related when they're killing each other over street corners and that. If you, if again, if you have the full legalization of marijuana, even to criminalize the harder substances, I'm not saying you do these things, by the way. You shouldn't. I mean, it's bad, but it's your choice. But uh, a lot of that we cut down greatly. And what? you still look at places, I'm sorry, you look at places like Portugal where they, they have, you know, they criminalize drugs and less crime, at least in that regard. What about the role of like the YMCA, city social programs, right. Right. Uh, you know, community involvement right. in, in like stuff like gardens? Do you have any thoughts on that part of perhaps maybe uh, Curing gangs, because specifically, I, I know of a church in the southwest side that helps ex felons get back reintegrated into the community. They have a a couple of ba you know they allow basketball in their in their sanctuary, you know, in their gym, and they really have done a good job in helping you know people youth turn their lives around by providing some positive examples and role models. And, and, and that should be always there. I mean, it's there right now. I'm just saying to make it better. You know, these are my solutions. But you, you haven't have any specific policies on you as aldermen in helping those programs well, it, out. The office of alderman, alderwoman is, you know, is a legislative process, so everyone would have to agree to it. I would hope so. Now, or we could take a combination of ideals and put them together. But this is, these are just my personal solutions. Okay. Uh, I think you, you, you have one. 
Uh, I can't see it. So, uh, you said you were from the 48th Ward. Yes. Could you please give a short, succinct speech, in other words, an elevator speech, why you think you are better as an alderman than Harry Osterman, okay. the current uh, recipient of that position? I can tell you quickly. Be brief and specific. Sure, sure. I can tell you quickly. So when I decided to run, you know, look, we, when, when we had an issue of trash building up in the area, especially on Granville and Broadway, in my neighborhood, and you had small businesses over there reaching out to the alderman's office, and you know, as alderman, as alderwoman, whatever, they, this is their job for sanitation. The trash was sitting there for two months, nothing happened. They came up to me like, we know you're running, we want you to come look at this. I opened up the uh, newspaper vending machine, there's stuff and trash and drugs in there, so I cleaned it out. So I do a whole YouTube video, Facebook, I post this up, people see it, Guess what? He saw it. He finally got rid of the whole thing. Another thing is, when it, when it comes to me just coming off the street and you know actually helping out the community for one, we, we have construction currently going on at uh, Devon and uh, Broadway, and the crane is turning. Okay, there's a crane and it's building like you know the, the condos or whatever, and people are walking underneath this thing. This is a big safety hazard right here because you can get squished. This happened to Evanston. Someone recently died because of a construction mishap. Yeah. So I. People will reach out to me in the community. I'm not in office now, but I'm taking an initiative because I'm working from 7 to 3.30 during the weekdays. And I get off work and I enjoy doing this, by the way. So it's not like I'm complaining, but even on my weekends. And it's like, if I'm putting this much initiative in, to make these things occur, to make sure safety is there in place, and I might as well be alderman right now. I mean, here's the thing. East Andersonville, because he's very popular in East Andersonville, and it's a very nice area. I've been out there. I was petitioning out there today. But you can't neglect North Uptown, because that's like the black sheep of the area, with the issues they have out in Buttercup Park, where you have some people from the SROs, uh, single uh, residence of uh, rooms. Yeah, there you go. Where, where they're trashing the park, and, you know, and people feel unsafe, and they've even called me out there to see what I could do, and I made calls to the SROs in the areas, but listen, you know, I understand, you know, these people can be out here, but they shouldn't be defecating, they shouldn't be urinating in the parks, they shouldn't be doing this on private property. And you, perhaps it's because of the weather, perhaps it's, you know, school's back in session, but, you know, I'm doing what I can to help out the community. He's not doing that so much. He's too busy in East Anderson, though. I want to help out everybody. I don't care who it is. That's, that's what I want to do. That's why I'm doing this. I'm not even going to pay to do it, but I'm enjoying it. Uh, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, if I were to vote for you uh, for Alderman, uh, as I understand it, you recently and abruptly left the Libertarian Party. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I know that you wouldn't abruptly uh, leave the aldermanic office and leave it a mess? Okay, that's a fair question. Well, I could say that when it came to me leaving the Libertarian Party, see, there were things I didn't agree with the Libertarian Party on, personally, when it came to health care, because I don't know of anywhere in the world where there actually is a free market model. Sometimes they like to talk about Singapore, but Singapore it has health savings accounts. And that's just like Social Security. That's how they put the money into it. Uh, when it comes to... Well, being online, for example, and you're arguing about how the roads should be funded when this is a local government thing and you want to leave it up to corporations, I don't think so. I mean, technically, a toll is a tax in a way, you're, but you're paying a corporation. I mean, that's what local government specific function is for. Uh, and not saying that all libertarians are like this, but there were some that were in favor of lowering the age of consent, and I could not be a part of that. Personally, I'm like, no, thank you. That's just the reason why I did it. Um, and, you know, on this political journey, as I made it very clear, I just tend to be more comfortable being independent because I don't feel like I'm confined in a sort of political party box, I like to say. So I could just be myself. I mean, independent, sir. I might come across independent who may not agree with me on health care or wherever it may be. Some might lean a little bit more right, some might lean a little bit more left. But these are the things I'm offering, these are my views. Yes. That didn't well, answer my question. Well, that's why I left it. So, yes. One out of three black men have access to guns. <laughs> I'm, I'm One out of three black men have access to guns. Don't you think that is a big thing in the, in the shootings and killings on the south, in the south and west side? So are you, so are you saying because they're black? Or so they have guns. They have they guns. Have One out of three. Guns. One out of three have guns. So in Chicago, they're, they're obtaining it illegally is what you're saying. Oh, no, I'm not for stopping tricks. Absolutely not. 
Yeah. If you're talking about stop and frisk, no way. Stop and frisk. Nope. Yes. No. And I'll tell you why, because it, it, that, that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to start discriminating against people who are black and brown. I mean, there might be someone, normally most mass shootings, by the way, if you want to talk about race, it's usually statistically white. Are they going to stop and frisk a white person? At most time, no. Yes. They don't. Do it. No. No guns in the public. Blacks. Blacks are the victims and the shooters. Oh, yeah. yeah, but I mean, when you go out to the suburbs, for example, there's, there's, but there's a lot of pedophilia, there's a lot of white collar crimes too. They have to be victims of that. You're not representing the suburbs, you're representing the suburbs. No, well, I'm, you, but you're trying to say that it's all the black people's fault, it sounds like. I didn't say all. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. I, I wouldn't yeah. want to get her first. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. yeah um, okay, thanks for her. I'm, you know, a member of the Alliance Against Racist Political Repression. Have you heard of CPAC? I have. Police? Yeah. What do you think of that? Well, I, I'm pretty much in favor of them because I, I do know that they want civilian control to set department policy. And uh, you, you look, you got any confident superintendents? Are they corrupt? They got to go. And I'm not, I want to add on to that because. For people who do argue against that, they say, well, it's the mayor's job. Well, it's like, well, it's the mayor's job to set, uh, to, you know, to set up the uh, workers' comp, but you have Alderman Ed Burke, who's in control of that. He's been in there since, ooh, 1969, nearly four, 50 years, and that's not his job. So, I, yeah, I'm in favor of it. Um, you know, New York was a pretty uh, dangerous place for a long time, and, uh, they increased their police force from like 15,000 to 40, which you mentioned. Yeah. So you want to increase the police budget here. Is that to hire more policemen? Well, for me, I would like to see more detectives because we currently have 952 detectives. Most major cities have 2,000. Well, so it's like that percent the detectives don't, don't troll the street. But they saw the homicides that we had, well, and he saw them. That's all. after the homicide. Right. Right. So but but we, we do have a major homicide issue that the crimes need to be solved. Though. Well, I mean, we, we can't have cops well, everywhere because they can't stop the crimes when it's happening. Uh, a, a few months ago, there was a whole series of crime on the south and west side in those five areas that are the worst in the city. And that weekend, the police put officers on the street day and night okay over a weekend and there, nobody got shot or nobody no, nobody got killed and then they went back and took those guys and women off the street so why wouldn't you want to hire more police on the street all the time in order to dissuade people from doing what they're doing because the neighbors know who's doing the shooting sure well i think i already mentioned that with the other solutions ahead i think you have a lot of that violence cut out i'm not against like there being cops in those areas, but I'm pretty sure there's other crimes that could be solved. If these things I mentioned were implemented, we'll probably see a lot less of those uh, activities occurring. So what are you going to do with the increase of 1.1 billion to 2 billion for the police force? That's what I'm asking. Well, that, that's what I'm talking about having the detectives. But, but, but they're, detect they're heavily underfunded. That's what I'm talking about. 952 detectives, that's 7% of the police force right there. Most major cities have 2,000 or more uh, detectives. That's why New York is better successful. They're, they're able to solve the homicides. They have more police on the street. Well, they, they have more detectives than we do, too. Well, it's a bigger city. Yeah, but, I mean, we, we need more detectives. That, I mean, you can't have a V-Cop trying to solve these type of cases. They're not, they're not for that. They can walk the streets. If they have someone doing something, that's their job. But they're not detectives, though. Yes. Do you think there's a problem with corrupt? Like we saw, you know, with the Jason Van Dyke, that they're kind of wall of silence, they're covering for each other, and not really trying to solve the crimes, like the, they are the problem. Like the abolitionists say. Have, have well, you yeah, I'm pretty, yeah, there's obviously, you know, corruption within the police force, just like there is in the city hall, trying to cover up for each other. I mean, to speak about, to speak about the other reason why I'm running, and, you know, the alderman I'm running against, Harry Osterman. Now that he's the only one guilty of this, I mean, there were 46 other aldermen. When they heard about there being a the potential dash cam footage of Laquan, you know, being shot, they were trying to push the $5 million settlement on his family before there was even any wrongful death lawsuit being pushed out there. And then when I, when I see, you know, party politics being put before a potential, I mean, this innocent life, well, this is another reason why I'm doing it, because it should never be like that in the first place. Yes, Charlie. Yeah, there are on the books 
on the federal, state, and local level that are known as labor laws, which are in place. Yet you're in favor of this civilian council, which is going to do investigations, <coughs> conduct themselves like some sort of board, yeah. and determine, determine positions, and like arbitration, grievance arbitration no. cases. Just investigate. And these are civilians who apparently have apparently a bias against the police force. Is that an objective assessment of if I get this When you're wrong, you're wrong there, as you should be There's an officer of the law in this room, and if he goes before this tribunal, well, he would have to, do you think he's given any chance of, see, of an objective? Well, he would, he would have to be... That's my proved of doing some wrong, first of all. They just it sure it sound like it right. the literature. You're out to get cops. <laughs> no. The cops are out to get them. FOP. Yes. The, these uh, migrants coming over the border, uh, a lot of the, them have uh, this disease. They're, they're kids, and they go to school with our kids, and they're giving them polio. Polio. It's not your fault. I'm just telling you. Well, me personally, I work in healthcare, so I always take my vaccines. I, I don't know anything about that, if that's true or not. To be you, want, you want this to be a sanctuary city? It is right there. Yes. Okay. See, I don't know anything about this. Okay. Sanctuary city, you don't know about that? Okay, I got a question. Yeah. You want you want guns on the street, right? Yeah, you know, the no yeah. stop and frisk, and you want concealed carry. So any more on the walk in here. Have rights. Get the hell, get all guns off the streets. Yes. Thanks. You could have them in your house. I am pro. I am pro. I am pro Second Amendment. Excuse me. I'm pro Second Amendment. I think that's the wrong one. <laughs> but I want cops. They can stop and frisk me all they want. I don't give a damn. You want to have people in the African American neighborhood? You want people carrying guns around? Big hillbilly cops. Did no. you say that? E explain no, that. that. Yeah. Because I'm sick of hearing about all these shootings. Did he say that? No. You want to have guns up. You don't want to get stop and frisk, and you don't want to get rid of the concealed carry. I want to No stop and frisk. Okay. Did you allow guns on CTA? Explain why I you don't, don't want I, You know I can't set CTA policy. So that would be up to CT. You know, most, you most of Chicago, most of Chicago, no, most of Chicago is gun free, and these businesses, even private, can set that. I have no control over that. Uh, some guy with a gun can bring that in here, AK-47. You have to talk to the restaurant owner. I don't own the restaurant. <laughs> nah, yeah. I don't. Hey, okay. you know, so, stop it, Fritz. Okay. Get rid of concealed carry. This is more of a comment than a question or anything else. No, it's well, not. I want to hear the answer from that. Hold on. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Who's in English? It's not a yes or no answer. I want to explain why you don't want to stop the Are you in his accusation? I think people need to understand, in my opinion, something like stop and frisk without reason. Tough. In other words, you no tough is not. I don't get cop can stop me. That's no. Yes, that's a question. But that's kind of this is all right. That's where I live. That borders on okay. something that the Nazi Party would have loved to do. Oh, and other stop. it is. It is. Yes. All right. Yeah. I don't no, know. Right. Yeah. All right. A brief reminder to the crowd that this is a question period. We will have plenty of time for comments after the questions. Can I have your attention, please? Uh, there's some confusion here going on tonight. This is the question period, and not not for making full statements or rebuttals or anything like that. If you have, try to form it as a specific question for the speaker. And Let's keep the college rule, the first one there, um, one fool at a time. Okay. Everybody else, please give this, whoever is speaking, give them a chance. Thank you. Okay, you rephrase your question and he'll try to answer. What is wrong with stop and frisk? And what is wrong with repeal and replace concealed carry? Okay. Okay. What is wrong with stop and frisk? Because statistically, it has always targeted black and brown people. Yeah, and well, that is, it's facts. Now, your other question? What was the other question? Yeah, are you in favor of concealed carry? He forgot already. Do I favor concealed carry? Well, I mean, look, your Supreme Court gave you the Supreme Court case. They, 
they have uh, ruled on that issue. Now, I said locally there can be restrictions when it comes to that, uh, the Second Amendment and the, any other weapons. Because Chicago, you can't own an AR-15. That's not changing. You can own a uh, handgun, you can even own a shotgun, but you have to have a concealed carry. I don't you want have somebody have, walking well, you, you, here. Well, no. I'm, I'm just telling you, that's the rules here. That's the law. I didn't make it. This is the state of Illinois. Oh, and Chicago you have to have a FOIA card as well. That's just how it is. Sit. Next yeah, question. what the part would you play as far as getting jobs for people? And what would you do to get the jobs? Because I think that's the basis of the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I've mentioned about, like, the promotion like military service or even National Guard for those individuals or even working with the private sector again if there are openings uh, give you something to make a target if there is something you can refer them to that that's what the whole uh, becoming a, a man program is about too besides the mentorship that they recently uh, had with the budget for the city another question yes um, years ago I had a tenant who said that there were certain gangs in Chicago who were actually encouraging their members to join the military to get training um, have you heard anything about that? I, I've never come across anything like that. Yeah, wow. Well, really? Because normally they usually do the vet and, you know, you're going, I was in the Navy, but they, they all do the vet and the Army and all that, too. Another question? Uh, Over here, in the corner. Would you increase the mentoring programs, funding for those mentoring programs? Well, yes, of course, yeah. Repeat the question. No, she, she's asked if I would I'll be in favor of increasing the mentoring programs. Yeah, yes, I would. Yes, for the kids, yes. All right. Kanye West, Kanye West said he could solve the, the gang problem by uh, releasing Larry Hoover. You know Larry Hoover. Yeah. He's a, release him and he can control his gangs. That's what Kanye West said. Is that a question? Well, that's, that's a question. That, that's, how, that's how it was done. You know, they, they, they have their, their head, their bigger head, they would control the gangs. That's more like the mafia. I don't, I personally can give you my answer if I would agree with that or not. I don't know. Sorry. I was talking to Trump. Well, yeah, well, he also said he wanted to abolish the 13th Amendment. <laughs> so I don't agree with that either. Another question? Charlie? Another question? Yes. And then you're uh, David on the website of the Libertarian Party <coughs> candidate for governor are photos of him giving instructions to his 12 year old son on how to, how to use a weapon. Uh, are you in favor of these kinds of things since you seem to have a, a gun rights approach to some of this? that? Children, well, you're, talk, you're talking are, about are you're talking about rules? their candidate kind of cash. Are there any rules like, about young people having weapons in this city? Or is well, there's there's Nazi? parental there's parental oversight, which I'm aware of. So he it's his child. Um, I mean, some states do it differently. The city has no say. Well, I think the 16 was parental guidance, though. The 16. Well, it's being oversight, oversight in this state. I mean, personally, I don't, I don't own a gun. You know, what Cash Jackson is going to do with his kids is his business, as long as there's no sort, sort of abuse. But, but that's the state law. He lives next to me. You live in uh, you live in Lake County. Charlie, are you talking about your crazy neighbors? Yeah. Carter, kids got guns. Oh, yeah. This crazy. I have I have kind of a two-part question. One, how did they know that it was the SRO people? Shut up, guys. Keep it quiet. Please. One One call at a time, please. How did they determine that it was the SRO people uh, making problems in the park? And the second question is, what specific programs uh, are you going to support for housing, for low-income housing in the 48th Ward? I'm glad you asked that. So the, the, uh, when it comes to knowing who's who, it's usually the neighbors, you know, because they're, they're out there, they sit there in the windows and they see where these people go. And the police are very familiar with these individuals out there as well. Now, you can't arrest someone for just sitting in the park, but... Interesting, they don't catch these people doing these things, but in the, and again, the people that live in this area, they see this, they're not taking pictures, which is strange, which I say, you probably Every should if you see what he's doing. Camera. Yeah, they don't even have cameras out there, and they start talking about doing that now, you know, these common sense things. And your other question, I'm sorry. Was, um, uh, okay. I, oh, for, for the low, for the yeah, programs, no, I, right. I just wanted to slip in that a lot of people who are in SROs are people who are 
uh, in mentally re uh, right. uh, handicapped or uh, mental health problems. Right. Yeah, I would be in favor of increasing like uh, funding for having even the mental health facilities built in the 44. But I've always talked about when I've been petitioning, you know, I'm in favor of uh, the tiny housing units for those who are homeless. So I don't, I don't really blame some homeless individuals for not wanting to go to some of the uh, shelters they have in Chicago because most of, most of the common complaints is that their stuff is getting stolen. They don't really have their own space. You know, you see in places like uh, Washington State, Arizona, the name of a few, they, the tiny housing communities are working. You know, it's a temporary way to get back on their feet. It's been a success, and I'm actually happy to endorse it. Another question? Over here. Oh, no, you, you had one. Get your hands up if you got a question. Uh, go ahead, back here. Um, the uh, city of Chicago is insanely in debt. Any ideas on how to address that? Good question. So, you know, I've, I've been doing surveys, you know, with people on my email list and asking them, like, what's a, one question, what's a good way to save the money of Chicago? you got to make cuts somewhere, right? Well, one, I mean, maybe this is ideal, some people might think this, but if you reduce the wards from 50 to 25, because most major cities don't have 50 wards, except for New York, they have 51. But at least in New York, they have term limits for their older men and women. Uh, it, would, it would save, what, $12.1 million right there, if you, if you do the ward reduction. And uh, another thing I've always talked about, some people say this is novelty, it's never gonna happen, but if you really push for it, I, I do think that you're gonna have to start making cuts to the, to the mayor and the older men and older women's salaries. I mean, the minimum you're gonna pay is 106,000, 106,000 just to do a, a shitty job <laughs> to run in the city. I, I, that's where I would cut before I do anything else. Over here. Well, uh, uh, sh 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 Chicago is retraining all the police officers, giving them two, two days of training, retraining. <coughs> do you think they need better training on, on when to uh, use lethal force? Because a lot of these shootings, it seems like a lot of the police are wrong. Well, when you're shooting people and walk away from you, that's a big wrong. Now, I would say, you know, if, if it, because there are rules of engagement, if a person is about to pull something out, you do have a right to give them a warning, they do this, and you have a right to so much to defend yourself. But if someone's walking away, you shouldn't be uh, busting caps on them. It's just common sense. Alex. 16 shots too, especially. Mm -hmm. You had a yeah. question? Yeah, I've, I've thought about running for alderman or, oh. or something. It seems like the only way to really change and try to do the right things. But um, I, my experience has been that it seems like the, there's monies that go from the Democratic Party, you know, to these aldermen, sure. and the chances of an, a newcomer breaking through are kind of slim. I, are you? How do you feel about it? Uh, well, looking at the current state of our uh, political affairs, I mean, you, you got Trump in there, and that kind of changed up things too. And Abraham's not in there anymore, so there's a lot of his friends. He's not going to fund. He, they did have a, a breakfast thing where he, he gave up his last few two, twenty thousand dollars to Joe Moore, for example, and a few other uh, incumbents. But I can say from my experience with Harry Osterman, I mean, yeah, he's an incumbent. He's going to outraise me. I, I could put a good ten thousand, maybe twenty thousand to this race. And I'll be honest, that's not bad. And I've, been, I've never had an issue actually funding, you know, getting funds in. Do you, have you seen any polls, or is there any way to know um, whether, because I would just think the awareness right. in the area. Right. Uh, well, I mean, hard. just going on the street. Nothing official like poll life, but just going on the street talking to people, because yeah. as I mentioned earlier, East Andersonville, you're going to have a lot of people that love the guy, no doubt, but Edgewater, especially North Uptown, they, and I, I'll be nice with the words, they don't like him. There's a lot of other worse things said. Yeah. Because there's yeah. just the neglect. It's like, you know, if you're going to, you know, be in office, you, you have to, you do have to treat everybody equally. Not not everyone who's potentially gonna fund your campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, Los Angeles has fifteen aldermen. You know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Um, do you know how long it took to get down to fifteen in LA? A very long time. Really? Yeah, it took it took a while because I, I believe they were at twenty three at one time. I, I don't know how big of a number it was before. So how were. how long would it take to go? How long? Well, okay. Well, here's the thing. I can't be the only one who espouses these views of me in there because you keep more of the old guard in there. They're they're not going to go for that. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So 10, 20 years, 30 years. <laughs> Let's try to make it sooner, but yeah, maybe 10. Realistically. Jim, New York had its Robert Moses. 
Los Angeles had its, uh, what's the big water guy down there? John Mulholland. John Mulholland. Do you think Chicago needs somebody like him to help upgrade our transit and infrastructure? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm actually very fond of the CTA side. I, I, it can always improve. I mean, if people's complaints normally were, you know, sometimes the train comes late, but sometimes it comes, you know, right on time, too. I like the CTA. Some people complain, though, I, I personally. No, Robert Moses was the guy who bought the beaches, the parks, oh, and the you're, highways. Oh, you talking about privatization? No, no. He was the one responsible for... This is after the Second World War. Right. And uh, Mulholland was responsible for all the water projects and a lot of the uh, public works in uh, Los Angeles. What my asking is, is that uh, seeing as how you know, we, we have Deep Tunnel, we have some of the other big projects, but... How would you address the infrastructure of Chicago? Would you have a super agency? How would you do that as aldermen? Well, Roads, bridges. Well, right. Well, yeah, currently in the uh, 48 floor of the city, also a little bit of the Fort yeah. Erie being office, they, they are doing a gradually modernization program where they are expanding the platforms and all that, and where you see the trains are being upgraded. And this is something I would be in favor of doing as well. What about the Crosstown Expressway? <laughs> that, I, think, I think anything that helps improve Chicago when it comes I, I mean, Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I, anything. I, I don't want to keep us in the dark ages or anything like that. I'd be in favor of that, yes. I am. I'm also in favor of the. Uh, Free uh, rides for the CTA for the seniors too. Yeah. Yeah. I it was Bogoyevich that had that. It wasn't. I'm trying to remember. It was Pat Quinn yeah. that took it. Bogoyevich had it. Yeah. Pat, Pat Quinn yeah. rescinded it. Maybe that's why they get rid of Yeah. Yeah. Chicago. I would be in favor. Of Chicago City Council were to you know push the free ride for the seniors. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's 704, Andy, and I know a lot of people have had questions already. Um, 704. 704. We're 45 minutes away from the normal rebuttal. Normal rebuttal time. Do you think we may want to try to go into it right away and let everybody get a chance to speak for about six or seven minutes? Uh, if we're almost out of questions, uh, we can go to the rebuttal early, but what do you guys want to do? Rebuttal. Okay, if there's any questions, uh, get your hands up. Uh, you know, let's still we got plenty of time in the question period yet. But if you're out of questions, then we can go to rebuttal. And we can go like so, five or uh, six minutes. Who's got a question yet? You right here. Speak up, young man. I, I have a very simple question. I, I think I'm missing it on the writing in here, or maybe you were talking fast and I missed it. I, are you running on, uh, under some kind of banner or party? So I'm a, okay, so the thing is, uh, with the automatic race, it's not person. Myself, personally, I identify myself as an independent. As an independent, so no party allegiance? No. Yeah. Well, that's the perfect thing. I mean, I'm not going to be beholden to one specific party. My bosses should be uh, my constituents. That's how it should be. Okay. Uh, don't you think you would be better off if you were on the Democratic banner? Or? Well, you, you'd be surprised because there's a lot of people who are kind of mad at the Democrats, too, for some things in my ward as well. And you, you're not going to run as a Republican. Oh, that, that's a death sentence in the 48th ward. <laughs> yeah. Charlie, go ahead. Did the police stop someone at, in a stop and frisk or searches a vehicle from court in, in the process of ensuring my personal public safety. Can you tell me precisely what civil right has been violated of the person if they say thank you, you can go? If there's suspicion, they can, you know, they can Tell me what specific civil right has been violated if they say thank you, they stop a car or an individual and say thank you. And they consented to it? You're saying they're consented to it? They, they consented to the search. Well, they have to ask for the search, right? No? I don't know. I think he's talking about stopping. Yeah, there's people on the street. I'll stop him. No, I still think it's that. Do you tell me? 
you know, I'm not interested in what you're for. I'm telling you, what civil right has been violated? Well, that would, that, that would be your right to privacy. Fourth Amendment. Right to privacy? You do have rights to privacy, yeah. Your Fourth Amendment. That's the Fourth Amendment, yeah. Do uh, you have a favorite among the candidates for mayor? Do, do, well, there's too many of them. I don't even know for mayor. There's too many of them. I don't. I don't know. There's what 22 right now. I just. I just. <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. But it kind of got me choked up there because I'm trying to think. Who would I favor? Mayor Ricketts. If you ask me about governor, I can tell you that shockingly would be J.B. Prisker, though. That's just me personally. It would be. Okay. And, I, and the only reason why I say J.B. Prisk because I've, I've known Bruce Rauner personally, and uh, I'm not going to say any bad words about him, but I don't care much for him. Yeah. I, I met someone who, on the south side, a black guy, that said, we, you know, that Rauner's given out a lot of money for um, people going around to, you know, kind of buy votes on the south side. Um, are you aware of that? I, I know when, oh, okay, I'll give you a good story, and this, you can look this up. I know when he was running this first time, you know, he, he did promise uh, the, the, uh, the black uh, individuals in the area that he was going to invest in the infrastructure and all this. He, he, put, he put like a million dollars into a credit union. Uh, well, all they got, well, he, well, they didn't get it, it was for like some commercial, or, so they got jipped out of that. I, I know he has given money personally to uh, Pastor Corey Brooks, who he's bought out over there. I mean, it, but this is politics. They all tend to do that where they have their pastors, to, you know, to siphon the votes, you know, from theirs. But Rauner, <laughs> and I'm trying to be nice with this, just from my personal experience, because, you know, I've done work with the GOP before. He would, how can I put this? He has this aura where he expects you to like him. I don't know if it's because it's because he has money or whatever. It's like I I have talked to J.D. Pritzker personally. I met him many times, and well, he was always friendly to me. Where he just reach out, say hello. I'm like, I didn't expect that. I was like, okay. But he was real. He, he seemed he seemed a little bit realistic, and you know, I'm not going to put down Cash Jackson because Cash Jackson, the libertarian cat, he's my friend too. Uh, but uh, if the goal is five, six percent, you go for it. But I, I don't want to waste my vote on that personally. All right. Let's get in the rebuttals, okay? Well, it's okay. certainly, but, uh... Okay, this is the famous rebuttal period, so, uh, well, we have time, I think. Everybody can have at least four minutes. No, we'll go five, Andy. Go five? Yeah, okay. we can go five. Go to the bathroom. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go for five minutes tonight on a rebuttal, so see if you can make an earth-shaking rebuttal when you come up here. It means you're going to have time. Uh, let's go, you guys. Sid, you're always up. Go, go. Sid's on first, and get up there and spot away. It's a baseball game. First. Yeah, well, Ricketts for mayor. <laughs> All right, um, Andy, five minutes. I listened to a program on Saturday morning. It's called This Is Hell. His, his name is uh, Chuck Muir, and he's on the uh, Northwestern University station. Well, anyways, he had a guy on from New York, and it was very, very scary what he said. What happened was the Republicans had a meeting about a week ago in New York, and they invited a guy from the Pride, the Pride um, Party, and the Pride Party is, is a fascist party. It's just a now now fascist party, and he was the, the speaker, the main speaker at this uh, Republican meeting. And what happened was there's a lot of demonstrations outside against this fascist speaking. And he, he, they got into a fight with the fascists. And what happened was the police came along and who did they arrest? They arrested the people that were against the fascists. So this sounds very much 
like the brown shirts in Nazi Germany. Very much like it. And actually, the Republican Party is actually morphed into a fascist party. And they, and they don't uh, hide it in any way since uh, Trump came into power. So we're entering a very, very dangerous period in the United States. I thought it wouldn't happen so fast, but it's happening. And Trump is going around talking about the left-wingers and how you have to stop them and they're a danger. And he talked about this uh, politician in North or South Dakota. And this politician was asked a number of questions by a reporter. He picked up the reporter and he slammed him on the ground. And uh, tr Trump was admiring what he'd done. This is really out and out fascist tactics. As far as uh, running for alderman, I don't know if he has much of a chance because if you don't have money behind you and you don't have advertising on, t on TV or radio or in the paper, you don't get your name recognized and they don't, uh, nobody even knows about you. And in order to get the money, you have to pretty, be pretty reactionary for the most part. I don't think much about the Democrats either. What happened in Nazi Germany, the so-called Social Democrats, the Communists wanted to get together and have a common front against Hitler, and they turned around and they supported Hitler. So if you're waiting for the Democratic Party to really do something, you're wrong. But if you push them from below, maybe they will do something. Okay. All right. Five minutes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, um, I'd like to say that our speaker, when I asked the question, uh, which specifically was, uh, if you uh, abruptly quit the, uh, the Libertarian Party, why then uh, would I not expect you to abruptly quit being alderman and um, leave the office as a mess? Uh, he talked in circles, so he never answered the question, and uh, when I called it to his attention, he said, that's why I left off on that. Well, if that's the kind of an answer he's going to give on a simple question like that, this guy isn't fit to be an alderman. I don't think this guy is fit to be a, uh, a uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, dark <laughs> um, a precinct captain. I don't think he's fit to be a precinct captain. In any event, uh, when he uh, was in the Libertarian Party, which wasn't very long ago, uh, he was seeking a nomination and uh, he spoke against his opponent, a man named Sanj Mohib, and told everyone that he was a pedophile. Uh, th this was absolutely wrong. I don't know why somebody would say that about him. I happen to know Sanj Mohib, and he's a real nice guy. But when a person goes around making wild accusations and statements like that, they're, again, they're not fit for the office. Thank you. Okay. Of course, as usual, I am totally unprepared. But I heard the speaker. I am surprised he's from the 48th Ward. I live in the 48th Ward. I asked him the question, uh, give me a succinct statement of why you would be a better alderman than Harry Osterman. Uh, I did not get that succinct statement. I am a supporter of Harry Osterman. I live in the 48th Ward. I live in affordable housing. Harry Osterman has supported affordable housing for us seniors. We've never had a we meaning seniors. I'm speaking as an individual now. Senior groups that I'm in have never had a problem giving to Harry Osterman. 
He's called me, Harry Osterman, has called me on the phone specifically in, re in response to questions I had or comments that I had. His mom was alderman before he was alderman. Before he was alderman, he was state representative in this area. I support Harry Osterman, and I'm going to vote for him. Thank you. Yeah, boy. Okay. Five minutes. Hi, my name's uh, Luke Matthews, and uh, I'm an uh, irregular attendee nope. here. And um, thank you, David. I didn't hear everything you said, but um, I wanted to comment on violence and gang violence and the violence in the city of Chicago. Uh, one of the most powerful political statements I ever heard was many years ago, in 1992, during a debate, a presidential debate, and you may remember it was Ross Perot, George Bush, and Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton went on to win. And the question was, if you could do one thing for this country and make it happen overnight, what would that one wish be? And uh, as I recall, um, Clinton said something about health care. I think Bush said something about taxes. And Ross Perot said, I would wish every child in this country to have a loving mother and father. And I never hear any talk from leaders and politicians when it comes to the crime problem about the family. This problem, in my opinion, is not going to be solved by the government. <laughs> it's going to be solved. It's going to be solved by the family, faith-based communities uh, from a whole different area. And um, um, and I think uh, the solution lies there. Thanks. All right. Next. We have a clear mic and no speakers. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Hi, um, my name is Ellen Corley, and uh, yeah, I did. I missed most of your talk, but um, I think I came. It's an interesting one. It's a real issue, the gangs, and uh, you know, I think I'm all for new candidates running for office. I, I do think term limits would be a useful thing to have. Uh, I think people come into office and it, especially in Chicago, it seems to corrupt them. Um, you know, there's, it's a cultural thing, I think, to an extent. Um, I aspire to run for office, I've said for mayor, because I, you know, studied for the last three years, tried to address it started with gun violence. I was working with the Obama's Organizing for Action Fellows Program, and we picked the gun as an issue. And we were looking for coalitions and research on the subject. And what I discovered was I think the police are the biggest problem. The, the, it's really the state repression, um, you know, that there's a corrupt thing going on where if you've got a corrupt police force and a corrupt a corrupt uh, politicians, um, the aldermen, there's, um, it does lead to a uh, Nazi kind of fascist thing. And um, I think we've got all the signs of it, but you don't see it. And I, the big issue I'm zooming in on, I'm just, I don't know how I could possibly get 12,500 signatures, but I haven't given up yet. Um, because it keeps me focused uh, and involved and engaged. But I think the bigger issue um, I'm looking at now is media. Um, I'm going to give a talk on it now with, you know, why is the media discourse so crazy? And um, I think that's because of the censorship in the media that it's kind of got us just at the level of, you know, of yelling at each other, um, the discourse is so divided. We're basically atomized. We're we're kind of like opposite football teams, or you know, and it's just like I'm 
identity this, I'm identity that, and there's because the media isn't really uh, focused on the issues. So we're we are not getting smarter as a community. You know, we're we're atomized. I think there there's a whole theory around this, um, but it, it's very deceptive. I know Hitler said. Um, once he got the media, it was easy from there, you know, it, the, no problem. It also helped that the bankers were funding him and, you know, um, right? But, um, you know, it's, and I now think he was talking actually about the American media. You know, the Liberty Lobby was, was uh, and America First, you know, um, were very active. These are, were the ones that were selling the gas to Hitler, um, he wouldn't have been able to do all that without them. Ford was the Auschwitz plant, um, you know, and the Bush family um, was union banking, financing him. So, you know, my biggest thing is reform, and I, a question I was going to ask, and if I, I mean, the, it'd be easy to fix if you or me were mayor, or any of us, any normal, not kind of, Rob Emanuel really is, his father was an air gun terrorist. It's a fact, just like Benjamin Netanyahu's were. And this is really the people who did 9-11. So um, it's, I, I also want to get Christopher Bolin here to solving 9-11. Um, you know, it's, there's all the facts, but nobody believes you because it's not carried in the media. Real easy, you know, no problem. You know, they just leave it out. It's what they're not, Andy talks about, blackout but um or white out for the media but what it's what they're not saying it's the suppression um the things that you're not hearing about there's little awareness of that it's tearing this democracy down by the roots you know the um in georgia you see you read into it's not voter fraud as the republicans would say like i'm going to come and vote but twice because i'm mexican and i don't get to it the issue is they they make it so there's lines a mile long for black people and they just shut them down or they just take you know thousands of their signatures and throw them out so um you know it's it comes from the top you know it's really easy to fix a system and in Chicago, we know the aldermen, um, the first thing they did when Rahm Emanuel went in and said, let's vote, no oversight. They don't look, no no inspector general, no, you know, you don't have it. Try to find an inspector general in the, in the country or in the city. You know, there's nobody to go report this to. They're violating crimes right, left, and... Who do you tell? The corrupt guy? You know, that's how I got into CPAC, but with the cops, it's a dirty cop. You go, people go to report. We knew how a woman went to report. Her father was, she's being raped at home. The policeman, every week, go, let's, you want to show how this works? He takes her to a parking lot and raped her for the next year. A 14-year-old girl. She's now trying to report it. They go, oh, well, uh, take it to the, um, you know, over there to the oversight board, and we'll just hide it over there. Nothing ever gets done. Not a single okay. cop has been disciplined for murdering, raping, Your any of that. So we got problems, yeah. Something. <laughs> With regard to those gun enthusiasts over there who insist on stop and frisk, yeah, well, that sounds like Nazi Germany to me as it does to so many other people. You don't need to hunt ducks with an Uzi. And I'm sorry. I don't, I believe in, I'm a firm believer in gun control. And I'm sorry, the Second Amendment is not a suicide pact. Um, the government can and should regulate the rights, should regulate who gets to carry a gun, and what kind of gun it is and all the rest of it. In regard now to those folks who think that third party and independent candidates are the answer for, for our problems and who run, want to run for mayor or alderman, well, I happen to be an old time Chicago and Cook County Democrat. And I make no apologies for that. And when I hear that 12,000 signatures are required, and the daily I refer to here is the elder mayor daily, my response is, thank you, Mayor Daly. <laughs> All right.
Go ahead, Mark. No, that's not it. But Margaret, if you've got to go, go. Please. We got, we got time tonight. Don't tell Did you raise Mayor Daly? The elder Mayor Daly. Um, I would like to talk about uh, a couple of things about. Um, yeah. I would talk, like to talk a couple of things about um, actual uh, gang control. One is obviously the schools. We've spent the last 70 years from the Second World War cutting funds to segregated schools. Chicago is institutionally, systemically, and historically segregated. And because it's been segregated residentially, the uh, neighborhood schools are segregated. And the schools that are in uh, wealthier or middle class communities, the parents are able to fundraise to mitigate some of the effects of this <coughs> cutting of resources that goes on. But schools in the poor neighborhoods are not able to really because the parents are already overextended. And um, the result of, is that many children in low-income communities in this city do not get a good education because the school had to make a decision to cut the reading teacher, to cut the library teacher, who also does the information technology teaching, to cut the math, um, the special math teacher that helps supplement math teaching, that um, something like, I don't remember my numbers, and I don't even remember how many schools there are, but something like 50 schools did not even have libraries, including 20 high schools. Now, in the words of somebody or another, what the fuck, people? How do you do a school? How do you help children become adults in the society where a library is truly a resource? That was why it was founded as a resource for adult education when you are not helping children be able to use the library effectively by cutting your librarian and not even having a room to have extra books in. When you increase the number of the class sizes, I don't know if you've ever dealt with 35 third graders with a part-time assistant, but I have a news flash from the front lines for y'all. It doesn't go well. Now, there are some studies that say that teachers can handle that if they're experienced teachers, but there also has to be some other conditions in place, and that is that the kids in the classroom come from the same social um, and ethnic background. Then they work well as a group, but with an experienced teacher. Now, you show me any classroom in the Chicago public school system where all the kids come from the same background. You show me any. There's a school up here that the kids speak 30 different languages. They come from families that speak 30 different languages. So you have kids from uh, Russia and Eastern Europe and, so, and, and uh, not Saudi Arabia. They're too well wealthy to come here. Um, anyway, um, but you know, it, it just, you cannot have 35 students in a classroom. You need a special science teacher. You need a remedial and special reading teacher. You need all of these resources to really, and you need small classrooms. The guy in, in Minnesota, the governor who was the wrestler. Who was, Jesse Ventura. Yeah. yeah. He wanted 15 students in a classroom. He said, how the heck do you do it if you have small, if you have big classrooms? You do not. Okay, so that's one thing. And the other thing is this really restrictive definition of family as a loving father and mother. That probably describes maybe 10% of the people in this world. Um, anyway, and, and so I think that um, what we really need to do, in my mind, my opinion, is there are some fathers and probably some mothers who should be excluded from families. And, um, but we need to support the family system. 
We need to support children. And for the most part, if you're supporting women who have the children, you're supporting the children. If you are giving the women, if you are making available to women who work affordable and, and adequate and decent child care, then you're supporting her so that she can work and provide for her family and save money to send the kids to school. If you are providing health care for that family group, or for everybody in fact, you are promoting a healthy society. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people get this health care business confused. They think, no, you shouldn't, you know, you have to pay for your own health care because I pay for my health care. Well, you know, bullshit. Not very many people can afford to pay for their health care. Now, I retired as a nurse. I was 35 years as a registered nurse. And, um, and in fact, I had a master's degree. Okay. And I was a nurse practitioner when I retired. Oh, time. Okay, but at any rate, there were a lot of people that I took care of who had some serious financial problems that couldn't follow through with medication regimes, could not follow through with therapy regimes, were not well served by the way things are now. Here, here. Okay. You're ready? Okay. I don't have much to say today. The speaker's talk was like very, very get to know you talk, I guess. I don't know. It's the shortest talk I've ever experienced here. Um, so, you know that drugs is pervasive in society. Drugs are on the, in the suburbs as well as in the big city, rich neighborhoods, as well as in, it's just pervasive. But for some reason, there, there, there's violence the way some some groups practice the distribution of drugs. And there's no violence where other groups practice the distribution of drugs. And that was always like, gee, why is that? Well, uh, Linda and I just came from a movie called The Hate You Give. Okay, it's new, it's new out, about a week old if that. Beautiful movie about growing up in a combat zone. It's just astounding um, how growing up in a combat zone changes your thoughts of what's possible. You know? um, and so I advise everybody, I would say everybody, if you haven't been to a movie in a while, go see the Hate You Give. It's a two-hour movie, The Hate You Give. Okay? Um, and along those lines, I don't know how these kids from the Middle East are ever going to survive because they're going through the same shit. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, Andy, five minutes. I'll take a few. Uh, I've got it, Andy, don't worry. <laughs> Once again, I agree with Margaret 100%. She's absolutely correct. Uh, we have a, to summarize it, we have a for-profit system. And I'm, I'm getting ready to give a talk on actions speak louder than words. What are corporations saying to us by their actions? Different companies, different entities, well, the drug companies are saying to us, we're sorry your kids are dying because you can't afford the medication, but it's not personal, it's just business. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that your kid needs a, a life-saving operation, but if you can't pay for it, well, uh, we're sorry he's dying, but we need our billions. Right. Uh, the defense companies say, uh, we're sorry uh, that we're having uh, your sons and daughters slaughter women and children all over the Middle East, but we make big profits selling our weapons to the military. General Butler wrote the book, War is a Racket, 19, 1935. Art Eisenhower 
warned us about the military industrial complex. Today we have an educational, a media, a military industrial complex. They're all corporate billionaire driven complexes. The new censored news book that I mentioned earlier talks about how our, our corporate media no longer has investigative reporters that inform us about anything that really matters. They, uh, as Ellen said, you know, they, they cover junk food news and there's no, no time left to tell us about things that would um, improve our lives. Uh, right now in the suburbs there are some houses with solar panels going up. Nothing in the news about this. ComEd put out a report three years ago, 2015, said by 2015 solar electricity on rooftops is going to be cheaper than buying it from ComEd. And it's gotten cheaper since then. So, um, seventh graders are going home teaching their mom and dad after attending our science seminars that the future belongs to solar wind power, high efficiency. But Naomi Klein's new book, the one I mentioned, uh, this changes everything. She says the business model of the oil companies, they have reserves that in the ground. They, they, they drilled and they, they have these oil reserves, so they count that on the books like a, uh, a normal person counts money in the bank. And so they have five times more reserves in the ground that they intend to burn than will push the planet over six degrees warming. It's got to be left in the ground or our kids and grandkids have no future at all. Uh, the latest article that came out from the International Climate Panel said that we're, we're looking at catastrophe by 2040. 22 years from now, if we don't get our act together, in the next two, three, four years. We don't have 10 years to mess around with this. Uh, there's plenty of money for universal health care, universal education. It's common knowledge that if you have large classrooms, 25, 30, 35, 40 kids in a classroom, they're not learning much of anything, right? They're unmanageable, totally unmanageable. In the Army, that's what's called a clusterfuck. <laughs> the teachers aren't allowed to use that, but I talked to some teachers and said, yeah, that's what we got here every day in this school. One giant cluster one, where it used to be an educational environment. So, um, the last thing, almost everything really bad that's happening in America today, including the rise of Trump and the others, and the disintegration of our, of our political system, stems in large part from the Reagan administration starting to pack the court with right-wing judges that will rule against environmental protections, uh, all kinds of laws, and it slowly eroded to the point where in 2000 it became possible for Bush and Cheney to steal the office. And then nine, nine months later we have 9-11. Well, Homeland Security, uh, the Patriot Act, the, the stop and frisk. Uh, there's an article in uh, the News Censored News about this program nationwide of, uh, they were talking about on the radio yesterday, uh, somebody got uh, arrested while gardening while black. Uh, somebody said you can, get, you can get arrested by the police uh, standing while black, uh, having a coke on your front step while being black. Driving while black is a great risk for many, many black people. So uh, that's what's going on. And uh, Professor Griffin, who wrote 12 books on this, on the, the myth of 9-11, said, until the true story of what happened on the morning of 9-11 is told, we're not going to get our country back. We're living in a bubble like uh, there's this threat of Islamic, oh, uh, Osama bin Laden's going to kill your grandma if you don't vote for, for Bush and Cheney. We got that crap for eight years. And now Trump is just... It's a gross distortion of the language to refer to Donald Trump as president. He's a corporate criminal psychopath that is being allowed by us right now, we haven't done what's necessary, to remove that criminal from office and prosecute him and put him in jail. And he's surrounded by a whole bunch of other people that also should be in jail. Captain Kirk said it best, our five-year mission is to go where no man has gone before, and that's where we are. Nobody alive today has ever seen an administration like this. And so the first step, log on to Common Dreams and Project Censored, those two, and log on to Sunrise Movement, the Sunrise Movement, and you can donate to it, you can uh, help other young people learn about it. It's an army, a building army of young people that want to vote 
good people into office, and they're having success nationwide. If you, anybody needs any more information about CME, I'll be at the back table here. Thank you. Next, please. <coughs> All right. I got five. Oh, wait, but I've been cutting people slack at six, so. Uh, I wanted to say something about the, uh, the, the high violence in, the high gun violence in Chicago. Um, it, it's, it's a big problem in that uh, we have, uh, you know, all you have to do is open any, any day you open up a newspaper and you'll see reports about all the people uh, uh, and that's uh, criminals and innocent bystanders being hurt by violence. Uh, the drive-by shootings, um, the, the families that are really just scared to, to hang out in, on, on their own front stoop. It's just a, a really terrible crime uh, that, that all this is happening and you see it in the newspapers all the time. And what what concerns me is that I, I don't think people realize or maybe don't remember that there's actually a law passed that had a huge impact on this problem. It actually cut uh, gun deaths by almost 50% within about five years after this law was passed. Does anybody know what law I'm talking about? Concealed carry. And guns. You know, they passed a law that ended the prohibition of alcohol. This is just like, this is just a historical fact. And, and some people might want to deny the analogy between uh, the drug of alcohol and the drug and the other drugs that are being taken place today. And I think this is either uh, an ignorance of history or maybe just uh, just convenient denialism. Um, when, uh, 100 years ago, when they, they outlawed alcohol, this was hugely supported by the American public. I mean, imagine how hard it would be to pass a constitutional amendment now. Mind-boggling. I mean, nobody can even imagine that happening for any issue, but we did it 100 years ago. People came together, and all the states came and passed a constitutional amendment saying, we absolutely know that this is going to deal with the problem of alcohol. And it is, it, and, and I just think that people kind of forget this or don't know it. It creates a huge amount of problems. The uh, the drug industry. You, you have, um, you have. I mean, look at the police. Everybody's talking about the problems with we don't have enough police. Well, one of the problems with the police department is they spend so much of their energy dealing with the uh, drug criminals. A huge problem. And then you've got people who are, look at how many people are in the court system who are related to uh, uh, drug crimes. Look at how our prisons are choking with people related to drug crimes. And then to make it even worse, you have this disproportionate focus on uh, people of color. The, all these statistics are coming out that drugs are used at the exact same rate by whites and by blacks, and yet most people who are arrested, uh, who are charged, and who are imprisoned are, are black. And so we're spending all this money, a tremendous amount of money, on all these problems. And then when you talk to police, you ask them, okay, you do these huge raids, you go out and arrest all these people. Have you seen any decrease in crime in the drug problem? No. Because for every person they arrest, there are a hundred people waiting to take that job. It is this massive, massive problem. And it's directly related to the gun problem because that's where they get their money to buy the guns. Well, they're not finding guns in the street. Guns cost money. So. So if you want to have an effect, the same positive effect on the, on the gun problem uh, that they had in, uh, during alcohol, after alcohol prohibition was ended, then you have to re rethink our approach to managing the drug problem. Now there's a problem on doing that, a political problem, and that is that there's an emotional argument against uh, stopping the uh, stopping the drug laws, 
And that is, so if you want to talk about a failed drug uh, policy, somebody's going to look you right in the eye and they're going to say, you want people to be on drugs. You want addicts. You want kids to do drugs. Right. It's an emotional argument. It's, it's, it's designed to avoid statistics and, and avoid facts. And I don't know a way around that except trying to encourage people to just talk about it more, to start looking more at the statistics and start looking more at uh, uh, the articles that are coming out and complaining about all these problems in, the, in our failed war on drugs. I, I think that everybody is missing the argument. Everybody looks at it and they say, okay. are, drugs, are drugs good or are drugs bad? Should we have the laws or should we? And I think it's really a choice. You either choose to have the drug law, if you choose to have the drug laws, that's fine, but it means that you're supporting the black market uh, for uh, the black market economy for drugs. I think the choice should be you want to do something to fight the black market drug economy because that is by far uh, the worst social uh, cost. Thanks. I've been allowing six minutes. One fact that he didn't uh, get uh, briefly, uh, we have a for-profit prison system in this country. So it's highly, highly profitable to uh, get, grab people off the street for all kinds of stuff, especially drugs, and put them in a for-profit prison where they make, uh, we as taxpayers shovel money to them to keep them in a cage. Other countries don't have that. Thank you. All right, Don Ritchie. Yeah, uh, All right, a uh, gentleman earlier said that the problem of crime cannot be solved by the government. Um, I would, well, if it can't be solved by the government, then, you know, it can't be solved by anyone. Because, now, you know, it's the responsibility of government to maintain order and enforce laws. I mean, that's actually right here in the, in the Constitution, in fact, I mean, it's right here in the preamble, because the preamble says, among other things, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. What does that mean? It means, means that things are nice and peaceful at home. Well, how do you do that? Well, by, by stopping crime and, and, and chaos and so on. And, and so any, any society, any country, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's your favorite. It doesn't matter if it's if it's the United States under Trump or Cuba under Fidel Castro or Canada, any or or Sweden, any country. Um, you know, the, the government has a responsibility to maintain order and enforce the laws. I think even the only people who wouldn't agree with that would be anarchists. I mean, even libertarians would agree that even libertarians who believe that the government that there should not be any public schools or public libraries or or public health care would still uh, would still say that the government should at least enforce the laws. So uh, so it is so like it or not, it is the responsibility of the government to do that. Um, now, and somebody brought up the whole question of uh, I forget was that you, Dave? You were talking about about people who are pro gun and at the same time in favor of stop and frisk. No, and I'm I against stop and frisk. No, that's me. Oh wait, who who is somebody who's Mike? Stop and frisk. Period. Oh, okay, so you're pro gun and you're pro stop and frisk. Yes, yeah, so you could. We're not going to get rid of the Second Amendment. Okay. Ridiculous. All right. All right. But, but you do. Okay, but you. All right. All right. But you do. Okay. Okay. But you do want to get rid of the Fourth Amendment, as I see. What's that? Well, the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody knows what the Fourth Amendment is. I never heard of that one. The only amendment anybody knows about well, is the Second. Search. Yeah, there's no, there's no multi-million dollar uh, lobby supported by a profit-making industry uh, to, to defend the Fourth Amendment. I'm, all right, let me get to the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Hey, hey, Mike, shut up. Shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So, yeah, hey, hey, Mike, hey, Mike, you shut up. Hey, Mike, Mike, bite me. Mike, one fool at a time. Hey, okay. Hey, one fool at a time. Oh, great. All right. 
Listen, hey Mike, why don't you come down here and have a fist fight? I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll fight you only one handed, so uh, be fair. Don. I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. No. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So so uh, so this. Um, so yeah, the idea, you cannot be pro-gun and pro-stop and frisk. It's totally hypocritical. For one thing, you're saying that you worship one amendment to the Constitution, you, you, you claim to worship the Constitution, but, but that amendment, no, the Fourth Amendment. And here's, I will tell you how to make stop and frisk fair. Everybody, starting with Mike Lehman, gets frisked by the police. And have it frisked all the white people, including including the women, the children, the elderly people. Everybody in this room gets frisked by the police whenever, every time they go out in public. And everybody, hands up everybody who wants a full body cavity search from the cops. Okay, Mike, I know you're a masochist, you don't count. You okay. Have you ever gotten attacked on the street, though? Okay, yeah, I have. By a gang? Uh, I'll get to that. Okay, now, um, to, um, now second, to, to blame crime on bad families. I think that's much too simple. I think crime has, there's a lot of reasons, and, and I don't think you can say that, 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 that having a good family, will, having, a, having a good loving family will automatically, with a good, with a loving mother and father will automatically lead to a person not being a criminal. Just as an example, yes. just as an example, uh, there's one famous man who, as far as I can tell, you know, all the so-called causes of crime, poverty, broken home, mother, uh, you know, out of wedlock mother, do not apply to this man, and yet he is the biggest criminal in the United States. I am speaking of Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> He's number one. That's right. <laughs> I'm going to go next, Charlie. Well, somebody please man the timer at the computer there real quick. So that, uh, you want to go next? Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll wait. All right, go ahead. Hi, how's everybody doing tonight? I've never spoken before. My name is Rose Gomez, and I'm here occasionally, not too often, but... Um, I heard about what the candidate spoke about regarding uh, his candidacy for alderman, and I did like what he said, which is to decriminalize drugs. I believe full heartedly that what we're doing right now, like Andy had said, is we're having a certain <coughs> jail system profitable for too many people, and that keeps a lot of people in business, and it's against their interest to criminal to keep drugs to make them illegal so um, I mean to make them legal and I believe that there's too many kids that don't have the same opportunities that all kids have and if we provide more opportunities for them then I believe that we can make a difference instead of jailing people afterwards that's not the answer you, you want to get kids to stop from going to jail. Why would you want to spend, in order to keep an inmate in jail on a per year basis, that's $70,000 and that's free medical care and so on and so on and so forth. Why would you want to invest that money afterwards in jail instead of trying to prevent a, a child from landing in jail? Invest the money in education and mentoring programs and so many other opportunities instead of afterwards and having done the crime and hurting so many people afterwards you hurt somebody like I, I actually knew the um, the person uh, his name was um, Alberto Alberto Bocanegra he um, actually went after the person who hit the cyclist and he was um, shot by someone else uh, because he was going after the person that hit the cyclist. So um, he got shot trying to be a good Samaritan. And as a result, um, he actually beat cancer. I mean, I mean, what kind of tragedy is that? But um, re regardless, um, I think the bottom line is to invest in the future with the children and not in um, jails. Um, and putting people, more people in jail, that's not the answer. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. Let's give that lady another round of applause for coming up and speaking. How about these? Will I get one? No. no. You, you don't speak, Charlie. You bloviate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't like. Um, I don't like Chicago being painted as a violent town when it's just a couple neighborhoods, and everybody says, "Oh, Chicago's real violent." And I know Edgewater's a pretty cushy area, although it's in between Uptown and Rogers Park, which could be rough, but it's still not as bad as some neighborhoods. So, um, yeah, and Charlie doesn't like that I'm wearing his shirt, but you know what? I think too many politicians are around too long. And it's, there's, we need new ideas. And, you know, look, look at what goes on with our Congress. A lot of corrupt people that get bought out. And, you know, you know you, it's all non bipartisan. Anyway, um, you know, there's tens of thousands of guns on the street right now with, with cops. We don't need more guns out in public. I don't trust anybody with a gun. I barely trust a cop with a gun. So, and we don't trust you with guns either. I, I don't even trust myself with a gun. That's why I don't carry one around. So, you know what? So what's wrong with stop and frisk then? I can start with you. They, you know what? They can do it all the time they want. I don't care. I'm not carrying drugs with me. I'm not carrying guns. What are they going to bust me for? So, uh, New, and New York uses it all the time. Yeah. So, instead of, you know, giving us the sideways, you know, oh, it's okay to wear, you know, the African neighborhoods to have guns and carry, why don't you come out and say, no guns in public, stop and frisk. That'll get you elected. That'll make you a superstar on the, on the, in the, in City Hall. It causes a problem. But no, everybody's afraid to say stop and frisk, get afraid to say no carry, you know. That's a problem in the city, you know. We're getting rid of a mayor right now. We had another mayor. They're dictators, Daly and Rahm, and nobody stood up to those knuckleheads. Daly got screwed the whole city with this stupid parking meter yeah. thing, and his family's profiting. And then Rahm, you know, He's a big dictator too. Bring back Daly's dad. Yeah, we want more dictators in City Hall. Richard J. So stop, do it. Stop and frisk, and no carry. Repeal and replace. No carry. All right, sit down. Jeez, what a tough crowd. Yeah. <laughs> you get an applause. All right, let's thank our speaker. Coming up here. You're out early, so I guess we had a little time here. I'm being eclectic as usual here. Uh, right now we're confronted with a, a city, actually communities, that are dysfunctional. And something should be done to correct this, because these are not minor issues confronting these communities. This is not something like pedestrian uh, garbage collection or something. These are life and death situations. Uh, so this is not a casual issue. Uh, the, the, the thing, in fact, in the matter is there, I don't follow it that closely, but apparently there's an enormous number of random shootings uh, far disproportionate to other urban areas in the United States. Even one shooting is a tragedy. But these are multiples and it's been over an extended period of time. So this, this is not just a, a, a mild, mild change in the statistics. Uh, this is a, a problem that seems to have some serious basis in the communities. Now, we have candidates running for office, I see, that want to instruct 12-year-old children in how to use assault weaponry. And presumably they have these in their homes and give access, like my loony neighbor, to his loony offspring 
to get an assault weapon. And let's say I kick him out of my yard or something, and they say, well, show that son of a bitch, Mr. Paydock. Yeah, you know, and they come back. And unfortunately, things had happened. But the fact of the matter is, I'm sorry, Don Ritchie, old people, and I've actually even seen one of these happen, young people, people of all ages, are suddenly confronted with life-threatening situations. And you claim that there is some constitutional right that enables you to threaten my life or anyone else's. Well, I'm sorry, that's, that's a misinterpretation of the Constitution. An inherent function of government is public safety. Right. And the Fourth Amendment, I assert, is not a give you a right to privacy. It is only applied by that. And that's been made well determined here. Now, you're claiming that the, now the, in, in the confronting the situation, the natural ones, you look to law enforcement and say, why are they doing, are they effectively doing what we asked them to do? And then you come along and say, well, law enforcement, you know, one of the things you got to do, now by the way, this thing about drugs, these guys, these guys are low life, man. I'm not kidding you, I, I had a little bit of the life of crime. If you, if you ain't got drugs, you're gonna find some other crime. So getting rid of drugs ain't just going to do nothing. It's not going to make these guys like go to church on Sunday. No. They ain't going to find Jesus because, you know, you, you, you legalize drugs. That's not going to happen. You know, that's whimsical. Um, and then you say, well, the law enforcement has to do something about this because they're endangering the lives of people in the community. We're having shootings in schools. You can't send your child to school anymore. You talk about schools. You don't know if you're going to see that child ever again. You're going to go to the theater, Ed. You see a movie, you ever think you're going to get out of there? No, because of this weaponry that's in our communities. And then you come along and you say, well, let's have the law enforcement do this. One of the things they do is they stop and frisk like in the airport. And you say, oh, this is inconvenience. This is my right, violation of my rights. What about my right to life? Does that have anything to do with you, Don? Do I have a right to life or the rest of the people in this room or my neighbors, my family? Maybe not. No, I guess not. There's some higher priority to this than my life. No, I don't think so. There's no law that's written that way. Anyhow, um, yeah, this inconvenience. Listen, I, I got stopped and Chris as a kid and I, this is no big deal. We knew we were up to no good and it stopped making this a, a thing here. And the other thing, you gotta be cautious about your group. I realize you got some issues there. You're claiming that they're coming after certain police are coming after a segment of the community. However, these people are the there are there are the people that are responsible for bringing about peace and tranquility to our communities, so that we can pursue and, and engage in normal life. You can't you can't let this continue. And I, that's what I mean. I think you ought to recognize this. And coming up with tribunals against police, that's right. Let's, let, let's restrict the police at the one moment we need them to do something about this. That's a good idea. Boy, that's real brilliant. Let, let's stop them from, from functioning. Certainly, we've got to correct abuses. But setting up some new sort, new sort of tribunal as, as, as I guarantee you that's not good. That, what is the effect of your thing going to be? I mean, the bottom line is there's random acts of violence in these communities. And that like people who are, hey, even this gun thing here. I've been with the against gun control for so many years. I'm even the only guy that's in the Illinois mobs against guns. Uh, but we've got to curtail the weaponry. I'm sorry. Uh, and this, 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 I mean, they did find a way to contain, to preserve the safety of people, passengers. I was at the hearings to preserve the safety of passengers on CTA. And I think we can do the same for our communities. Anyhow, he's cut me off here. I don't know, I give you a lot to talk about there. Pretty good talk. Come again. All right. All right. Good time. Thank you, Andy. Thank you.
There's nothing you can say against that. That's pretty definitive. <laughs> All of you have a lot of complaints against our country, against our way of life. Quiet! And a lot of times you have legitimate beefs. Call for order back there. All right. Hello. Hello back there. Hello back there. Quiet. Here. What I'd like to bring to everybody's attention is that in the next three weeks, we are all going to get a chance to have our voice say what we want to say. And that is by going to the local polls and casting your vote. You may not agree with some of the candidates. You may agree with others. But I have an uncle who probably proclaims that he has never voted in a national election in his life, and yet he is one of the biggest complainers I've ever met. Okay. And I say, you know, if you don't exercise your right to vote, you don't have a real right to complain. I honestly think that if you're going to do your civic duty and do anything to help better the country, at least get out and make your voice known by casting your ballot. I think everybody can agree that doing so on a voluntary basis by casting your vote for the candidate you like is probably one of the still fundamental elements we have left in this country to make our voice heard. We may not like some of the results of the elections, but at least you had a chance to go vote. I heard a story today on NPR when I was coming in. Afghanistan right now is having elections. And there's a terrorist group called the Taliban that's trying to blow up polling places. Yet at the same time, they've had some record turnout. Think about it. How many of you would actually go to the polling place if there was a threat of a terrorist attack in our country? Probably many of us would say no. My life is not worth it. But in other countries where it doesn't happen that often, the power to vote is recognized. And here, you know, in our country, we have early voting. We have many options to cast a ballot by mail, absentee ballot. So there really is no excuse not to get your say. In the last election, for example, I proudly cast my vote for president. It was for the Libertarian candidates, Gary Johnson and William Weld, but I don't think my vote was wasted because I voted for somebody that I thought would do a good job in office. And even the minor third party candidates, if they agree with your views, cast your vote for them and not with the lesser of two evils. It's imperative that we all get out there, all cast a ballot, learn about our local candidates, have our local candidates come in and speak at rallies and, and other places and give us some substance when you speak. I will say this, McHenry County is having an election in the next few weeks too as well. There's several referendums on there that I'm for and I'm against. Some of them involve upping local taxes. Others involve some of the reconstruction of infrastructure around that area. And some of them, frankly, are complete horse fodder. But I'm going to educate myself. You have the internet to look up the candidates, local and state. If you don't vote, then get out of the country. Thank you. Here, here. Yes, I did vote Libertarian last time. Charlie, I like Will, I like William Johnson. I like Mike, Gary Mike, Johnson and William Well. Yeah, oh, All right, Sid. Take a minute. Yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, I worked at Sears on Holman and Ardington on the west side. And I had to walk from uh, the place where I lived. This is about a mile. But what you've seen around there was factories all over the place, machine shops this kind of business, that kind of business. And if you uh, went down any major street in Chicago, you found all kinds of factories and people working in these factories and making a decent living. But they, all that moved out. 
we, how do we have any factories? I think um, I, re I was reading, we used to have about 25% of the working class in manufacturing. You know how much it is today? Less than 9%. So there's hardly any manufacturing, it all went overseas. And when you don't have jobs, what happens is you lose hope because you can't find your, you can't feed your family, you can't pay the rent, which is very high, the food is very high, so you have to do something. What do they do? They sell drugs on the street. That's the only way for them to make a living. And then they uh, contest one another for areas to sell their drugs and they kill each other. And a lot of people get killed just standing around that area. So you have a situation where there's no jobs. They tell you it's about a little over 4% is unemployed, which is a, a bunch of BS, because they don't tell you how many people stop looking for work and how many people are only working a few hours a week or a few hours a day. So when you add it up, it's about 40% really. The unemployment level is extremely high, and that's why these kids are going and selling drugs. And if you don't solve that problem, and they're not going to solve it under capitalism, because they find cheap labor overseas, they go to they go to Bangladesh, they go to China, they go to India, they'll go anywhere for cheap labor, slave labor, and they don't give a damn about the people in the United States as long as they make a profit. And the way they make a profit is imperialism. They go and control the resources overseas and the people there can't make a living. So you have a problem, a structural problem, but the whole system is bad. And you have to solve that before you can get people to not to uh, take part in crime. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, the speaker gets the last word if he'd come up. And uh, just uh, one single fact here. Uh, they were talking about it. Um, it cost $2.1 million to keep a troop in Afghanistan for a year. You could bring that troop home, man or woman, and give them a Harvard education all four years, and with the rest of the money, give away 43 hybrid cars to poor people that don't have a car. And our other speaker was absolutely correct. Where you have no jobs and no hope for these kids coming out of school, a lot of them don't even finish high school because you see, there's there's no hope. When you have no hope of getting a job, you have either the military, which is the, the poverty draft, go to Iraq or Afghanistan, or sell doing drugs. That is start selling drugs. That's a basic 60-80% of the African-American people in the communities where there's just no job, no factories, that's what they're faced with. And we have to address that issue that we're spending upwards of a trillion dollars a year on foreign wars right now where that money needs to be spent on rebuilding factories and everything else in America. Jim Mars said it in his last book, he said, there's three ways to get politicians out of, the, out of office. The soap box, the ballot box, and the ammo box. The ballot box coming up with the vote is the last chance we have without violence descending on the country to take politicians out. I would like to see them removed by voting. And that's what Sunrise, the movement, is all about. If you guys don't know about that, start logging out of that site, sunrisemovement.org, and look at Common Dreams every day. Common Dreams talks about good things where progressives are getting elected all over the country. It's, it's a movement that the mainstream press, the corporate press, the corporate media is not covering what's happening in America. So lend your voice to good things, okay? And support our speaker. You're up. Say thank you all so much for having me here. This has actually been fun. Every time that I come here and do this, I appreciate the <laughs> constructive criticism. I appreciate you know just the diversity of you know political opinion in the room. I think that's how it should be because uh, you always want to make you know the best out of someone like myself who's running for office. And real quick before I do end, I want to address a few things. The reason why it's short, I'm a humble guy. I don't like talking a lot, and I want to give everybody else a chance to uh, you know say their thoughts. Now, for the person who is supporting my opponent, I obviously 
respect that because you have that right to do so. Uh, maybe in his mind he doesn't feel I'm adequate enough as of yet. But hey, if I do become alderman, I'm going to have him call me up. He can tell me anything he needs, I will do, just like for the people who are doing it now. And that's fine. I appreciate that, and thank you for your opinion. Now, for my friend, when I formed the left of Libertarian Party, where I was accused of saying that my opponent at the time, Sanj Mohit, was a pedophile. No, I never said that. Actually, if you go look on his page uh, far back in uh, March, he was promoting a lady called Mary Ruwart, who happens to be an advocate of legalizing uh, child prostitution. This is true. She did do this. She's talking about it. this is all sunshine and dandelions and children should be do you know do these things and you know no <laughs> I'm sorry this is th th that was one of the reasons why I left the Libertarian Party but we live in a civil society where well we're going to protect our children that's what I intend on doing as aldermen as well especially when it comes to black kids you know if they're being discriminated against uh, by cops on the south and west side even the white kids it doesn't matter and I think the children are the future so with that said. Um, yeah, thank you again. I'm, you know, I'm just humbled with the fact that I get right. these opportunities to do this. So thank you again. All right. Ad Andy, adjourn us, please. That's it for the College of Complexes tonight. Thank you all for coming, and we will see you next week. We're out.